um, Olga Pasokoli from Imperial, um, who's been talking about uh, this topic. Um, prior to Imperial, um, did a PhD at Cardiff and then held positions at Loughborough, Birmingham, and Kings, I think. Um, Start, uh, uh, background as a cognitive psychologist has brought that through, but for many years now has worked primarily in, in medicine-based departments as a psychologist, very interested in how doctors and clinicians make decisions how, when they are, uh, um, and in recent years become very interested in um, this idea of decision aids and how we can um, potentially improve decision making through um, the use of AI and algorithms, and I think that's what we're going to hear about today. So thank you very much for coming today, I really look forward to your talk. Thanks, Nick, and thanks for inviting me. Okay, so I'll be talking about um, some research that I've been doing for the last three years that's funded by Cancer Research UK. Um, and it's mainly about how algorithms are used in um, uh, clinical decision making by general practitioners to decide whether to refer a patient that they suspect like cancer. Um, okay, so um, just a bit of the uh, background. Uh, in the UK, cancers are diagnosed later and at a more advanced stage than in other um, equally developed countries in the Western world. Um, and at present, about 52% of uh, the 10 most common cancers are diagnosed at an early stage, that's stage one and two. And the government in 2018 said that they wanted to increase this 75% in the next 10 years. So, so about 2028, 20, we should be at that, at that level. Um, and um, uh, one of the ways of improving this is to improve earlier diagnosis of cancer as a national priority. One of the ways to improve earlier that diagnosis of cancer was to introduce this urgent referral pathway, the two-week wait referral pathway in primary care, whereby, uh, whereby if the GP thinks you may have cancer, they refer you uh, on this pathway, and then uh, you will be seen by a specialist or, or for specialist investigations within two weeks from, from referral. And it's recently been uh, shown that um, using this pathway reduces the odds of late stage diagnosis and mortality for the most common cancers. Um, there is, how, however, large variability between practices in how they use this pathway. Uh, this has been explained um, both by how the local health services uh, are organized, but also by how GPs make these kind of decisions. Uh, in fact, in, a, in, in some recent uh, studies that used the signal detection framework, we found that discrimination, the D prime, that is the ability to discriminate between patients who need to be referred and those who don't need to be referred is, is pretty modest um, on average in, in GPs. I think the D prime was about 0.8, when a good discrimination should be about three at least. Um, good discrimination is important uh, because if you refer patients indiscriminately, then you will increase waiting times for other patients. Um, and also it's recently been shown that the proportion of this kind of referrals that end up with a cancer diagnosis is decreasing. Um, however, it's difficult to discriminate uh, at early stages of cancer because cancers present with vague symptoms, which they tend to be attributed to other more common conditions. So to, to support this um, risk estimation in the early stages of cancer, uh, these cancer risk algorithms were introduced to primary care. These are algorithms that estimate uh, the probability that the patient has cancer currently or in the future. Their uh, clinical impact in terms of uh, patients diagnosed early or patients' lives saved has not been uh, shown. Uh, they're not everywhere available or in some parts of primary care and where they are available, they tend not to be used. Uh, a, a small study with uh, Australian GPs found who were visited by standardized patients, that's actors, um, the patients, found that, um, well, when they interviewed these GPs afterwards, they said that 
Well, they looked at this, um, at the, the risk prediction only after they had made their own decision and they had negotiated management of the patient. And if it was very different from what they thought, they tended to ignore it. So there could be all sorts of issues about why these algorithms are not used very much, could be implementation issues or workflow issues, for example, could be cognitive issues, issues of trust, etc. Um, what do we know about whether people use probability algorithms? So the received wisdom is that um, clinicians are reluctant to use them and trust their own judgment more. These are, as you see, very old studies. They're uh, cited extensively, and they uh, it was about clinical, clinical psychologists, actually. Uh, we also have more recent research on algorithm aversion and egocentric advice discounting. Now, I won't be talking about algorithm aversion because this is mainly about people committing to use an algorithm in the future. So they see how the algorithm performs and then they decide whether they want to use it or not. Um, I'll be talking more about ecocentric advice discounting. Um, so this suggests that people don't take sufficient account of advice given to them and they tend to overweight their own estimation. And it's been explained by anchoring, for example, we tend to anchor uh, too much to our own initial estimates or we are uh, confident about our own initial judgment, therefore we don't really give enough um, consideration to the advice given to us and we don't update our estimates enough. Um, or the other idea is that it is due to information asymmetry. So we have, uh, we have access to our own justifications. We know why we think that, but we don't have access to the reasons of the justifications of the advisor. So we tend to take less account. Of them. Um, and this uh, centric advice discounting measures uh, how much advice is used in the actual judgment. Um, most of the studies that um, are about ergocentric advice discounting have, been, have, have used general knowledge tasks, so sort of low importance um, tasks and students as participants. And they use the so-called judge advisor uh, system. So uh, participants are presented with an uncertain quantity. They give an initial estimation. Uh, then they're provided with the advice, which might come from another participant or an expert or a collection of individuals. And then they give the final estimate. And the way that advice utilization is quantified is by using this weight of advice index which shows essentially how much people have moved from their initial position uh, relative to how much the advice is different from what they initially thought. So it's this ratio of um, uh, opinion change, the difference between their initial and final estimates um, uh, over the advice difference, the, the difference between their initial estimate and the advice. And the values range from zero, which means that you haven't taken any account of the advice whatsoever, to one, which means you've adopted the advice completely. And typically in the literature, we find values of 0.3 that's supposed to show a strong advice discounting effect. The other uh, prediction of the egocentric advice literature is this uh, the relationship between opinion change and advice distance. So essentially, uh, it suggests that there is an inverse U-shaped relationship. So initially, when uh, the difference between your estimate and the advice is not very much, you start updating, but as it gets very different, then you, you start ignoring the advice because people tend to ignore advice that's extreme to their own. Um, so that was about the, the kind of practical applied um, context and the, the theoretical background. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this research now. Um, we wanted to investigate whether can, these cancer risk algorithms can actually influence uh, clinicians' risk estimates and referral decisions, and also to test interventions to optimize their presentation and introduction to 
the GPs. <clears throat> So um, I'm, I'm hoping to present three studies, if I have the time. Um, you can see there the, the samples were quite substantial. They all um, uh, had GPs as participants. So the first study, uh, the first two studies were hypothesis driven and pre-registered. The third study was entirely exploratory. Um, so initially we wanted to see whether people, to what extent people integrate uh, an unnamed risk algorithm in various risk estimates and referrals. Uh, whether integration depends on advice distance, the relationship I showed earlier. Uh, and the intervention we tested was whether having information about the algorithm will make any difference, will, will make some people integrate more. Um, in the second study, that was a replication of the first, but also an extension. So we used a different kind of cancer and a larger GP sample. And we tested two interventions, a social proof nudge and an explanation. The third study was quite different. Uh, we wanted to see whether the way people perceive the benefits and harms of referrals and um, the severity of the various errors that might result from referring or not referring uh, might influence how they, um, the, the, their referrals in the presence of an algorithm. So I'll present the first two studies together because their design um, was very similar. Uh, they're, they're both online experiments. Uh, each was conducted over two sessions on different days, separated by at least 24 hours to avoid GPs getting fatigued. Um, so the first was about colorectal cancer. The second was about upper GI cancer, so upper and lower gastrointestinal cancers, uh, each used 20 vignettes. And the, the risk profile of the vignettes was quite similar. So it ranged for, from a very small half a percent risk of cancer to a, quite a huge uh, over 50%. So I'll describe the procedure. This is for the first study, but it's more or less also for the second. So when participants come in, when they access the study website, they are randomly allocated to groups. Uh, in the first study, it was a simple factorial design. So uh, between groups, so one, one group got information about the algorithm, the other didn't. Uh, they both answered, uh, everybody answered some demographic questions. Um, and then we asked them how confident they were when assessing potential cancer. So how confident do you feel when assessing patients with symptoms that might indicate cancer? Uh, they then answered uh, a number of questions about their awareness of these cancerous tools and what they, they thought about them. So in general, how do you feel about having cancerous calculators in your practice? Then the intervention group got information about the algorithm. And um, this is, um, we know in the advice taking literature that knowing about the advisor's expertise and accuracy uh, pretty much determines how much uh, their advice will get integrated. So we wanted to tell people um, about this algorithm. And also we know in real life when these algorithms are introduced to clinical practice, people don't get any information. They suddenly appear one day in their electronic health record and they're, they're expected to use them. So what would happen if we did give them some information? So we gave them information about the way this algorithm was um, derived um, uh, and validated and, and how accurate it is. So we tell them that it was derived from a large, it was all in black, the red font is just for the audience. Um, it was derived from a large cohort study of 2.5 million patients in the UK. Um, it estimates the probability that the patient has colorectal cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And it was validated on another large cohort of patients. Uh, it, it performs very well. So it discriminates correctly between cancer and non-cancer approximately 90% of the time. Essentially, it produces higher risk estimates for cancer than non-cancer patients. 
Um, and this comes straight straight from the area under the curve um, of, of, of this, this algorithm. So then we ask people, you know, um, do you understand any of this? We ask them, um, does it make sense to you? So you can see the result from the people who got the algorithm. Almost everybody said it made sense to them. Um, almost everyone said that they, they would trust its estimates, probably or definitely. And again, almost everyone said that they would like something like this in their clinical practice, probably or definitely. Great, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, then they got three uh, practice vignettes. This was just to get people um, used to the task, so they don't get any feedback at this stage. Um, and then they they um, they were given ten vignettes. And after they finished those ten vignettes, they got an an automatic link to access the second part of the study. So they remain in ten vignettes, but with at least twenty four hours in between. So this is what a vignette looked like. Uh, we uh, gave them some demographics about the patient and risk factors like smoking and drinking, and then a paragraph that says um, how the patient presents, what kind of symptoms um, they, they have. Um, so then we asked them about their own um, estimate of risk for this patient. So out of 100 patients, with the same risk factors and symptoms as this patient, how many in your clinical judgments are likely to have colorectal cancer? So as a frequency, give us a number uh, from zero to 100. We then wanted to get confidence intervals for this estimate. Um, and we asked them, what is the narrowest range which you are almost certain contains your estimate above? enter the lower and upper limits in the boxes below. And then we ask them about referral. So it's not a dichotomous judgment, referral or, or not referral, because we understand that people don't like to tell you, they don't have sufficient information. So we present it as a, as a scale, a type of what's your referral inclination? How do you feel about referral at this stage? So five point scale from highly unlikely to highly likely. So once they give uh, the answers to these questions, we present them with the same case. And now we say the algorithm estimates that, well, X out of 100 patients presenting like this are likely to have colorectal cancer. Q estimated Y out of 100. Uh, if you wish to revise your estimates, please do so below. If you wish to stick with your initial estimates, please re-enter them below. And we had to ask them to re-enter them, otherwise people would just not bother and go to the next case. Okay, um, so at the second session, as I said, they do the remaining 10 vignettes, and then we have this algorithm disposition questionnaire. So a series of questions we ask them to see how they, they felt about the algorithm, what their opinions were about the algorithm that they used in this study. So, you know, I found it helpful. I thought it was accurate. I was irritated. I was happy. I was frustrated. I felt more confident in my decisions. I appreciated having it. So it was on a, a seven point uh, scale from, you know, a green scale. Okay. So that was study one. In study two, again, a similar design uh, between group design we tested uh, a social proof nudge and an explanation. And I should say that uh, algorithm information was received by default but ev by everyone in this study. Okay, so um, social proof nudge uh, comes from the, the literature on social norms. So decades of research in social psychology has highlighted the role of social cues in how people validate their own behavior. So when there, there are no objective standards, we tend, to, um, we tend to, to look at what other people do, uh, especially others that are similar to us, our peers. Um, and um, this has been used uh, I looked for literature that used it in algorithms, for example. So I found one, uh, one small study with students solving maze problems. 
um, where they had quite good results by giving this social norms information. So they told uh, they told people that seventy percent of people have used this algorithm. Um, and it actually made no difference whether they told them it was 70% or 54%. They still get good results with this social, social norms nudge. Uh, and it actually had uh, more impact on whether people adopted the algorithm to help them solve the maze problems than if they told them that how accurate the algorithm was. Um, and also in, a, in an interview study with GPs, uh, GPs were being interviewed about whether they use decision support systems. They said that um, they're more likely to trust and use them if other GPs have already used them. Okay, so it suggested to us that this was, yeah, quite a promising intervention. Uh, in fact, we didn't just say to people that X percentage of your, of your colleagues have used this, but it was social proof on steroids. <laughs> we actually tell them that your colleagues have found this useful. Um, so what we told them was this, in our first study that investigated the impact of the algorithm on two-week weight referral decisions, 86% of participating GPs found the algorithm helpful, and 82% felt more confident in the referral decisions after receiving the algorithm's risk estimate. And this is actual data that come from our first study, the algorithm disposition questionnaire that I showed you, this is where these percentages come from. So we didn't lie, we told them the truth. Um, okay, now the explanation, the other intervention we tested, um, it, it kind of responds to this information asymmetry that I talked about earlier in the uh, advice that you literature, um, which suggests that understanding the reasoning behind the advice is necessary for adopting the advice, for accepting the advice. And it also resonates with more recent research on explainable AI, um, which aims to build trust and reliance on, on sort of black box machine learning algorithms by, um, by creating human interpretive interpretable explanations of the algorithms working and, and the advice. And a, for um, AI systems that aim to support uh, clinical decision-making, clinical reasoning, uh, and a popular way of um, explaining the advice is visually, a visual representation of the relationship between predictors, which in our case would be symptoms and risk factors for the patient, and the outcome variable, which in our case would be uh, the risk of cancer. So this is how we um, operationalized this explanation. When we, give, when we gave them the, the algorithm's risk estimate, we also tell them, here is the graph that shows the relative contribution of the patient's symptoms and risk factors to their overall risk. So each vignette had its own graph presenting this um, these relationships. And as I said, uh, they all got information about the algorithm as default, by default. Okay, results. Um, was the algorithm utilized? In, um, so I'm showing you results side by side for, for both studies, study one and study two. Uh, the algorithm was utilized indeed, and um, both risk estimates and referrals were updated after the algorithm was, was received. Um, and you can see that it's quite similar uh, in both studies. Um, estimates were updated by about 10 percentage points in study one, eight percentage points in study two towards the algorithm. And referrals were also updated by about quarter of a unit on the five, uh, five point scale. So there was significant updating. Um, if you remember now the, the weight of advice that shows how much um, advice, oh, advice is weighted, how much our initial opinion shifts towards, towards the algorithm. Um, and I said that in the literature, we normally get values of about 0.3. We got quite higher values of over 0.5, which suggests that people 
weighted the advice, weighted the algorithm slightly more there than their own estimate. Uh, that's on average. If you actually see the distribution here, it's quite uh, quite striking that in about 30% of the time in both studies, they ignored the advice completely, and in about 30%, they completely followed it. Why is that? We looked at, are there any uh, participants that consistently avoid or consistently adopt? No, there weren't any cases either. Uh, the only thing we found was confidence. Confidence in your initial estimate um, will predict how much you, you um, take advice into account. So that was confidence was measured um, by the confidence intervals, by the width of the confidence intervals of the initial estimate. Um, Advice distance. Do people ignore advice that's very different from their own? Um, in both studies, we find quite consistent results. So, um, well, they don't. They There is a, a positive relationship between um, updating and advice distance. Only towards the end, at large advice distances, we see that this relationship sort of starts decelerating, but it never becomes negative. It never <clears throat> becomes like this. What about the algorithm information? Did it, did it have any impact? Well, it didn't really. Um, it didn't seem to make any difference on estimate updating. You see, it's not significant. The base factor shows weak evidence. So we can't say for sure, you know, that it wasn't completely, uh, that it was completely um, irrelevant. It might have made some difference, but it's not something we can um, capture, we can detect in this study. It seemed to make some difference on uh, disposition. So people may have felt a bit happier having, having received this information, but the results are quite weak. In that respect. Social proof nudge and explanation. Um, it seems that the nudge <laughs> had a significant impact. So people who received the nudge updated their estimates more, and they also updated their uh, referral responses more in the direction of the output. The graph made no difference at all. Um, Something else that we came across that I, I thought was quite interesting is that people's risk estimates uh, became better calibrated over time, over the series of trials. When I say better calibrated, I mean that the advice distance reduced over the series of trials, which might suggest some learning. I put the question mark next to it. So in both studies, we see this um, that the advice distance reduces over the order of vignettes and is significant in both studies. And um, what I thought was quite interesting was that there, there was an interaction with, uh, with the graph. So, um, well, the interaction was not significant, but kind of borderline, uh, the, the, the base factors shows good enough evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis, which suggests that the people who receive the graph tended to learn more if that was indeed learning. Okay. okay. So the conclusions from um, the first two studies was that an unnamed algorithm significantly impacted risk estimates of referral responses even when estimates differed widely from GP's own estimates. Um, confidence in, their initial, in our initial estimates somewhat reduced the impact of the algorithm. Now, the social proof nudge um, is, was quite successful. It's a simple intervention. It's scalable. Um, so we would suggest to notify clinician users of, uh, of the algorithm's proven usefulness to peers maximize uh, impact and adoption. And, and, and social norms have been used in all sorts of different areas. Um, in, in medicine, you may have heard of the, 
of the letter that that Dame Sally Davis sent to different uh, GP practices about their antibiotics prescriptions and how much they differ from other prescribers in their to, in their area to to help people you know reduce their antibiotics prescriptions. It's been used with um, uh, for environmental behaviors, so telling households how much uh, other households in their area, how much uh, heating they use. But of course, it, it can it can have um, undesirable effects, especially when the people, you know, found out that, oh, I use less energy than my neighbors. I may, I may as well increase my energy consumption. So we need to be a bit careful with this. Um, and finally, I think that a potential learning effect, if this is, is really a learning effect, uh, could be quite promising, and and this kind of algorithms could be used as training tools. Okay, um, I'm not sure whether you take any questions in the middle of the presentation or, or oh, yeah, because I'm gonna sort of go to something qu that's quite different now. I was wondering if people had any questions in what I've presented so far. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know if there was any effect of um, GP's gender or seniority in how much you trust their faith. Uh, uh, yes, it was something with gender. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember now. Um, and it, it wasn't so much in the use of the algorithm, but it was in some of the questions we ask, um, I can't remember, uh, but it was uh, the idea was that females were less inclined to accept algorithms, or something like that. But I can't remember. But nothing about the use of the algorithm and how much the algorithm integrated was integrated. Uh, so we didn't find any relationships. In this study, we did find some. Anything else? Yeah. Just a question about explainable um, AI and your point that um, it's useful for the for participants to know what the explanation is for how the AI came up. So, and presumably that's done with software. Like you're making up an understanding of what the AI is doing rather than knowing what the AI is doing. How do you differentiate between an actual explanation for what the AI does and just what it's doing? terms of selecting. <clears throat> um, so we were simply telling them the algorithm uses this features of the patient and how much, how predictive they are of the cancer. Okay. So it doesn't give it a causal explanation for how. No, 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 no. So you don't know how it's doing. It was a simple regression. In this case, it wasn't a you know a machine learning algorithm. It was just a simple regression. So maybe I'm asking the more general questions that mm -hmm. um, we don't know how it's doing it. Then we ever trust it. Empirical question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So these people liked it or trusted it when you gave it this sort of um, imposing. Well, we sort of think it's good and it's working well, and other people like it. But if you had said. We have no idea why it's doing this and it's coming up with the answers, but it looks accurate, so use it. That would be yeah. Accurate. I mean, the people who got the, um, yeah, there were people who got both the social proof and the explanation. A subset got both the social proof and the explanation. Yeah. But no, we don't know. We don't know. Sorry. No, you go ahead. <laughs> Presumably, it's not a real consultation, there's opportunity for gathering more information and you can ask one question and plus that you might be going to go around your exam and the patients you know. So is like how, how did they deal with that in your vignettes, like dealing with not having this additional information? I, I was really surprised they didn't use that graph because for me that was immediately, oh right, yes, I know I was fine. And so is it because those are really familiar to them, all of those sort of factors, age, family diagnosis, et cetera, so they all don't trust it because that's what they were using already. 
No, some some people learned new information and they they told us in comments that they wrote afterwards that oh I didn't know that way was so predictive or I was using something else so they did learn um, out of this um, they didn't really the only thing that they complain about was about a new test that they have in practice which we didn't provide them but they generally didn't didn't say. You know, they didn't get the opportunity because they were writing things. It was all online. It was completely yeah, asynchronous. Yeah. That goes into the idea of trusting the algorithm. You don't have that extra information when making the decision. The idea is to actually the Yeah. Um, they, the comment they made also about the graph was that it didn't have um, a scale. So that it was all, all the all, all the bars were relative to each other. So there wasn't a scale from say one to a hundred or something. So that they didn't like that. Some, some people liked it, some people didn't like it. But yeah, overall, we, we found no effect of that. We were quite surprised as well. Can I take one last question and then yeah, move so, on? Yeah, thank you. So uh, really enjoyed what you said so far and that absolutely resonates with me as a clinician. I'm, I'm interested, your, your points about education, I think, are quite apposite, and I think you've got a cohort of people here who are educated in, in a certain way in, in medical school and in postgraduate contexts, and I wondered, obviously, you know, a lot of what you're saying about cancer diagnostic decision making, making is absolutely translatable to other aspects of diagnostic decision making. Mm -hmm. And there are many other healthcare professionals, apart from doctors, that are involved in referral pathways. And I just wondered whether you've done any work yet or had any insight into whether people like advanced nurse practitioners who are often involved in referring patients on to you know, certain key steps in understanding their diagnosis might be more responsive to mm. algorithms than, say, doctors would. Yeah, no, I haven't done that. I haven't picked that up. Okay, so um, so the final study is, as I said, very exploratory, quite different from what I've done so far. Um, and it would be nice to have your feedback if I have time to present it all. So um, initially I mentioned how discrimination, people's ability to say, um, this is a patient who should be referred, this is a patient who shouldn't be referred, it was pretty average. Um, was pretty modest on average. And we know that decisions are based not just discrimination, but also thresholds. Um, so two clinicians may have exactly the same discrimination, but decide to do different things because the thresholds for action are quite different. So some, someone may be inclined to refer, someone else might be less inclined to refer, even though the risk estimates are exactly the same. Okay, simple idea. It comes from signal detection theory. Um, so this is from um, these two signal detection studies that I did um, where um, 165 GPs, so one study was about colorectal cancer, the other study was about uh, lung cancer. 165 GPs, took part in both studies, okay? And when I looked at um, how their discrimination in the two studies uh, related, I found absolutely nothing. So there was no correlation between discrimination in lung cancer and discrimination in uh, colorectal cancer, which could be related to people's, people have different knowledge of the, symptoms and factors uh, and risk factors for each type of cancer, I don't know. But when I looked at their thresholds, what we call criterion in signal detection, it was quite a, quite a good correlation. So people who tend to have low thresholds for one cancer also had low thresholds for the other and, and the other way around. So there could be something stable in people's thresholds, in people's inclination to take action to make referrals or not make referrals, which um, I wanted to look into uh, a bit more. And this is what the study was about. And 
Uh, there's a really good article uh, in Psychological mm -hmm. Science for the Public Interest by Sweats, Doris and Monaghan, that talks about um, how psychological science can improve uh, diagnostic decisions. And they use signal detection theory to um, uh, apply to diagnosis, to medical diagnosis. And um, they, they say that uh, the optimal threshold for, for action, the threshold that maximizes benefits relative to costs, is the one that takes into account the probabilities of um, positive and negative events. So signal versus noise, the, the probabilities of, uh, of signal. Um, so if, if the, the probability of signal is quite high, then, um, then your threshold for action will be quite low. You, you tend to detect it quite a lot. And, and also, it's based on um, the benefits of correct responses, so the hits and correct rejections, and the cost of an error, that is, the misses and false alarms. Um, so I was quite interested in how people perceive the harms and benefits resulting from referrals. Okay? Um, so uh, I wanted to see whether these perceptions of harms and benefits, as well as how people perceive the severity of the different errors, um, uh, how tolerant they, what they are of false alarms, and also the risk attitudes can impact referral in the presence of a risk algorithm. So the algorithm in this study is pretty, pretty much secondary. So this was an online experiment with 200 GPs, and we only showed them nine vignettes in this study. Again, in a pre-post design, pre-algorithm, post-algorithm. And um, presented in a similar way, but here we asked them initially um, how likely they are to, to refer. Okay, And then we asked them about their own estimate of risk, but not as a numerical estimate, uh, but on a scale from neg negligible to high. So negligible, low, medium, or high. Once we obtain their responses, we then give them uh, what the algorithm says as a number, and then we ask them about the same uh, the same questions as before, like the of referral and um, their estimate of cancer. And after they uh, respond to these nine vignettes, we ask them um, about how they perceive benefits and harms of referrals in general, not about those specific vignettes. And um, we ask them about the um, um, harms and benefits for four levels of cancer risk and the three different the patient, the GP or the practice, and the NHS or society. Because here we've got the benefits to the individual, but also um, what happens to the NHS. So in my mind, I was thinking about waiting lists for, for patients. So you may refer this patient, focusing on this patient, what about, but what about the, the public perspective, the collective perspective? What happens to the NHS if you refer to many patients? What happens to other patients? This is how we ask them this question. So um, for each statement, I didn't see. Uh, potential benefits resulting from a referral for four levels of risk. Of risk. So if the risk of colorectal cancer is like, is negligible and the patient is referred, what are the potential benefits to the patient, to you and the practice, to the NHS or society, from negligible, low, medium, or high. And they, they were asked to do this for every level of uh, risk and for every uh, each one of the three stakeholders, medium and then high. And they had to do the same for, for potential harms. Okay. Um, then we also asked them, asked them about their perceived severity of errors, that is misses and false alarms, their tolerance of false alarms and attitudes to risk and uncertainty. So this is how we'll be asking about the perceived severity of errors. So with regards to two-week wait and referral decision-making, how would you rate the following two outcomes? We didn't want to use the term error 
on, on a zero to a hundred scale, where zero is not bad at all and a hundred is the worst possible outcome. Uh, referring a patient who should not have been referred from not bad at all to the worst possible outcome, and then not referring a patient who should have been referred. So um, here you, you have a miss and a false alarm, essentially. And we calculate this score as the difference between misses and false alarms. So um, a high score would suggest a high inclination to refer or a low threshold to refer. And you can see here, um, the mean is about 60, which suggests that they, you know, as a, on average, the sample is more inclined to refer, as you would expect. Here we wanted to see how people trade off false alarms for a hit. So as a GP, how many two week wait referrals for the patient turned now not to have cancer would you deem acceptable for one cancer diagnosis to be made by this pathway? And I'm looking at this now and I'm thinking, wow, these are quite interesting questions to ask for a, for a GP and how, how honest are they like to the people you ask them this? So essentially, what's the acceptable number of two week grade referrals for one cancer diagnosis to be made? Um, what we find, so higher scores would suggest higher tolerance of false alarms and low threshold for referral. And um, the mean is 43. So on average, people would accept making 43 referrals to get one cancer. But we see that there are some people there that they're prepared to, to accept over 90 false alarms in order to make one hit to detect one cancer. So people do differ in this kind of um, tolerance of false alarms. I'm not gonna be talking about attitudes to risk because we didn't really get anything out of this. Um, just quickly to show you the results. Um, this just shows uh, how people perceive harm to the patient, harm to the GP, harm to the NHS or society for referring a patient at different levels of risk. And these are the benefits. So as risk of cancer increases, the perceived harms reduce. And this is the same for all stakeholders. This is a bit all over the place though, for the GP. And, and the benefits are increasing for all stakeholders. So you can see the correlation, the intercorrelations are quite massive here. So perhaps we shouldn't have asked all these questions. Maybe one question would, <laughs> would suffice. People don't seem to differentiate between the different stakeholders. Or maybe it was just easy to respond the same for all questions, okay? We need to be realistic here. Um, so what we did, we, we just averaged across stakeholders. So mean benefits, mean harms, um, or yeah. And we see that both for referrals, before the algorithm is presented and after the algorithm is presented, um, perceived benefits and harms are predictive of referrals. And what I noticed is that the, 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 B, the beta coefficient slightly drops after the algorithm is presented. I tested this formally by seeing if there were any interactions with the algorithm. There were no interactions, but it somehow suggests to me that the predictive power of harms and benefits drops when the algorithm is presented. So if we're measuring something that, something intuitive that people are using, and then you present them with a number, they may be concentrating more on the number and their inclination rather than their own inclination to refer or not. This is just my own pet hypothesis. I've got no, no evidence for this or not sufficient data to test interactions. Uh, with only nine nine cases, um, in terms of um, in, in individual differences, uh, only the perceived severity of errors was a significant predictor of of referrals. Um, some interesting relationships with demographics, as I said, this is totally exploratory, so I feel. I feel justified to just test for everything. Um, demographics did not predict referral behavior. Um, we found that more experienced uh, experience GPs tended to perceive uh, more se severity of 
of false alarms. So they tended to think that false alarms are more serious than less experienced GPs. They were also less tolerant of false alarms. So they, they would um, accept fewer false alarms in order to, to have one hit. Female GPs uh, perceived that missing a cancer is more serious than, than, than male GPs. And they also perceived uh, more harms from referral uh, for the NHS and society on than uh, male GPs. Um, but there were also, um, the way GPs interpreted our questions about harms and benefits was quite different between GPs, but also between what I thought. Um, so, for example, someone says, is it a potential harm or benefit for a patient to be diagnosed with cancer? What am I supposed to be put in here? Um, and someone would say, well, <laughs> the, the elderly and, and at very high risk, well, maybe that's not so good to refer them for the society because they've got less to give. So maybe we should be looking more at palliative care. I mean, people would say things that you didn't really expect. Um, but someone said, well, I, I quite like that you had a section on harms of overdiagnosis. Um, or, or someone said, well, the expectation is for us to over refer. So the system makes us refer a lot. It's not that. I'm personally inclined, but there are external pressures for me to refer more, irrespective of what I think about what the cancer is. So conclusions, a bit more messy than the previous studies, this one, right? Uh, in addition to risk estimates, the decision to refer is also impacted by how people perceive harms and benefits and how they receive the relative severity of, of errors. Um, their perception of harms and error severity appeared to be related to clinician experience and gender. And as I said, I was trying to shed light into um, a sort of internal threshold, if we believe that people have this kind of threshold for action, threshold for referral. And I want to close with this quote from this particular GP who said, evidence-based medicine is key to guide us with risk pathways and calculators but we can never lose sight of our gut instinct. So I think what I was trying to measure is this gut instinct here. Okay. Um, just to say that the first study has been published. The second study has been under review for about three months now. And this, uh, the third study is, to be, is yet to be written. And um, I just wanted to show you the, the two people who worked on this project. Benz is now at Goldsmiths. He's just got a lectureship at Goldsmiths. And Kavlin is was our GP, the GP who worked on the project. That's what I have to say. We've got time for questions. It could be about the first part or about the study. Chat. Right, hey. please, that's great. I'm amazed you've got 200 GPs to pay <laughs> We pay them. Yes. <laughs> and we give them a lot of feedback. Yes. Yeah. That's great. That must be helped a lot. Mm. So I was wondering what you thought about giving people the um, algorithm information before they see the patient. I've seen this with surgeons that they would run the numbers on the risk of complications before seeing the patient. Okay, that's they got to the point of understanding that you know the machine was better than they So in that situation, well, like Helen said, the GP would receive the information and then be sort of testing for other hypotheses. And related to that, I also wondered about what happens if you have an do you think it would help to have an algorithm that gave alternative diagnoses? Mm -hmm. So it's you know, because that's the real situation. It could be colorectal cancer, yeah. it could be a IBS or and data and whatever, and that would mirror the sort of GP picture. So I'm yeah. talking about feeding them differential probabilities as a starting point rather than yeah. not letting them lose some of the patient until mm. to the algorithm. Yeah, I think this algorithm would best suit situations where the GP is already suspecting that there may be cancer and they're uncertain about what to do. 
Um, but we, we've we done quite a lot of research on a decision support system that presents people with alternative diagnosis. Yes. And what we found there was um, present them early on, as soon as they start, um, has uh, increases diagnostic accuracy compared to you present them much later on with alternative diagnosis. So, and you can easily combine those two approaches, having something that also presents them with uh, probability estimates. But yeah, I totally agree that suggesting alternatives at the start um, could be a, a better way, yeah. Do you think the GPs might come to accept looking at the evidence <coughs> before they really start thinking themselves? That's hard. <laughs> That's hard. They probably say it's it's for trainees. That's what they usually say. Oh, it's all right for trainees. Thanks. Well, maybe for the next generation of yeah. doctors. I was wondering about um, as you said, one of your doctors said that there's potential benefit in perhaps getting a negative. Diagnosis having been tested for cancer with your patients, um, and whether they were weighing that evidence into the decision to refer. And then also, given that it's this two week wait, whether the Jenkins were thinking about increasing waiting lists, because if we're just going to get a feed in two weeks, then that is in fact doing the cost to the NHS yeah, I really don't know what they were thinking. And I know they were thinking lots of different things. I started by having my own ideas about how, you know, the different considerations that, that go into, into the mix. But each individual respondent may be considering different things at the same time. Um, so, you know, someone might say, well, if I get a cancer diagnosed, that saves money to the NHS in the long term. But someone else might be thinking, well, but that creates more work for the NHS or greater waiting for, for other patients. So I don't know how people approach this. <laughs> but I think it definitely feeds into their, into their sort of what they call gut instinct. <laughs> or in internal threshold or... Do you yeah. agree that they should have still trust their system? It depends what that is. You know, if this is something that's influenced by this kind of pressures in their environment or the way they, um, they perceive um, harms or benefits, then it, it's something we need to accept. Um, I don't know. Why is that? There were three questions. If we try to go through them quickly, so Helen, Esther, and sorry, I don't know your name, but um, don't, don't come to me first. Oh, because I guess we're discussing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so maybe Esther and then. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Just, just quickly wondering, uh, do you have any opinion as to why um, GP with more experience would have a lower threshold for uh, Higher threshold. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what else did I find? I found that they, um, yeah, they, they tolerated false alarms less. I don't know. What, what do you think? I mean, you're a clinician. With so, so I think that the way you make decisions changes enormously over the course of your clinical career. And part of that relates to the, the Donald Rumsfeld concept of unknown unknowns. And you've seen a lot of, you've got very few unknown unknowns. You've seen horrifying things through your career. And so actually, in my context as an anaesthetist, I find that I'm, I'm often asking more questions at this stage in my career than I was, perhaps at the middle stage. So at the early on, I'm asking a lot of questions because I don't know, I haven't seen much. In the middle part of my career, I know more, but I haven't seen an awful lot of horrifying stuff yet. And then as I get towards the end, I've seen an awful lot of quite hairy stuff. And I'm very respectful of that. And I think that alters the way clinicians think. And in fact, do you remember that study we did, the Go No Go study for obesities? We found what you're describing, this issue of the very great variability in decision-making 
in go no go context. So obviously a different context. You know, it's do I take this patient to theatre or is it too risky? And and how people balance those risks. And it was difficult to gather information on their reasoning because it was just free text. It wasn't an interview. But it was that variability that was fascinating. And I'm actually fearful of gut instinct to an extent. There's very clear evidence, for example, in decision making around diagnosis of myocardial infarction in the emergency department, where people, for whatever reason, just choose not to use the validated scoring systems that are out there and go with their gut, and more often than not, they're wrong. And there's evidence for that. And so your points about how we educate doctors and how we make them aware of the existence of these cognitive biases is really important. Yeah, I wasn't advocating. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not a gut instinct and advocator by any by any means. No. Um, but I'm just recognizing that um, clinicians um, talk a lot about it, yeah. accept it, um, favor it. So I'm just trying to acknowledge that it exists and trying to sort of analyze what it is more than more than anything else. I mean, this thing fascinates me, but it's hugely challenging how you manage that variability in the people that rely on their gut. But in response to your question, I have no idea why more experienced GPs would accept fewer false alarms for, for a hit. I don't know. Um, I appreciated the uh, method that you, the approach that you took to the KV path. Um, uh, well, different sources of knowledge to reach a decision. Um, and I think this other question is about how um, decision making might be different, which is the types of ex experience. Uh, but I wondered whether um, you could have answered your questions just looking at the budget information. Um, so if it's if the broader question that you're addressing is how different sorts of information are integrated to each decision, could you have answered that question without making the changes? Not for clinical problems. Even giving the same problems to non-specialists, do you think they would come to different conclusions? Um, but which which questions are you referring to? The, 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 the benefits and harms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Because just because, because we because, because because the idea that we have um, we can discriminate between um, signal and noise, and we have different thresholds for saying this is signal. Then that, that applies to all human decision making. So if we, we can, I mean, the whole signal detection theory comes from um, radar operators in, in World War Two. So any kind of decision uh, can be deconstructed to 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 measure those things. Yeah. I guess I'm wondering to what extent the domain specific knowledge is interacting with these domain general oh, I see. principles and whether um, to address more broader questions about the did you did you need to look at it? Uh, you don't need to, but I think we always need to be mindful of context. Yeah, because context can you know, how many grand truths are there? Complex can really change our observations from, from one domain to the other. So we just need to be mindful of complex. So our goal will be different by lay people to do other everyday tasks versus professionals to do high risk tasks. So I was just citing from a very applied problem. Which yes, is, which is great. Which is great. Yeah. And I wasn't missing. Yeah, 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 no, but of course you can. Okay. Non lay populations to have Great. So let's thank Olga again very much for her talk. And one, one thing to kind of end, I say for me, I wrote at this at lunch earlier, I think I really appreciate about this research. I think it's lovely and obviously related to the invite is seeing the sorts of principles that I study in the very kind of actually in those exactly those undergrads actually playing out in these settings. So that my research is sort of gives me the sense that, you know, it, it, I see those principles happening in, in gen, sort of genuinely meaningful context. I mean, we can actually reach out and see that kind of research in practice. And that, but I, that's, I really enjoyed that aspect of the talk amongst many others. So thank Olga again for the presentation. Thanks for your questions. <laughs>